Welcome back, everybody. This is another double whammy episode. It will be posted to the Philosophy of Art and Science channel, but also to the Tawahedo Bible study. My special guest today is our sister in Christ, Andrea. How are you doing today? Hi, I'm great, Deacon Hawk. Thank you. Thanks for having me. No mm -hmm. problem. No problem. I'm so proud of the Orthodox Center for the Advancement of Biblical Studies and the kind of... Um, let's say ancillary institute the Ephesus school network that that brought us together uh, mm -hmm. mainly father mark bulos and dr richard benton who introduced us and yes. and we've been working together and i i want to get into the kind of work that you've you've gone into the there but i i do think these kind of small life story details really help paint a, a, a larger picture you're a nurse in your kind of day job and in addition mm -hmm. to all this beautiful work that you do on the side with the ocabs and with the ephesus school so I'd, I'd love to know was that one of those pragmatic choices or was there anything to do with your religion of choice that kind of inspired that journey of yours do you mean my decision to become a nurse? That's right. Yeah. No. And to continue being a nurse. Yes. Well, I, <laughs> that, those are two different decisions. <laughs> Correct. Well, you know, it's interesting how um, I really attribute the decision that I took to pursue that many years ago, about, gosh, 20-ish years ago. I It actually was the result of a conversation I had with our with our teacher, Father Paul Tarazi. Wow. Back, I, I don't remember the year. I want to say it was maybe 97 or 98. And um, just as a result of a chat with him about, you know, what's next and should I pursue, you know, the question I was, I had in my mind at the time was, should I pursue a PhD, you know, mm -hmm. kind of graduate level studies in, in Bible, or should I do something practical, so to speak? And he very much, you know, as a wise father would encourage me to do the practical thing first and foremost, which also, you know, resonated with me, which, which seemed the correct thing. So that's that's really how it happened. And then from then on, I, I uh, you know, I took steps to pursue that. And that meant I moved. And you know, so I moved out of state, went to school and then, you know, kept... were you in LA at the time? I know, I know you're here now. Were you there in LA at the time or were you no, no. in Boston? That, at that time I was in Boston. I, I went to Boston and lived there from 95 till almost 2000. And, uh, I was at, uh, Holy Cross Seminary there in Brookline. And, uh, and that's where I got really introduced to the Bible. And, uh, so that that's what started my involvement in Bible, biblical studies, um, through Father Paul's um, teaching and mentorship. And yeah, I remember at the the Jubilee celebration, the celebration of the completion of his 49th year and the beginning of his 50th year of teaching that we were mm -hmm. both a part of that you had mentioned that you had met him at Holy Cross there in the nineties. And that was, that was incredible to me. I did not know that it also sparked your nursing career. That was a total guess. I just, you know, because, you know, coming from like an immigrant family, you know, some of the most common professions, you know, it's like medicine, engineering, law are, yeah, are usually did. thrown at us. And so I wasn't sure if it was one of those numbers or if it had anything to do. And mm -hmm. so that's a, a beautiful sign of providence that those are connected. And for those of you who, who don't know, Father Paul Nadim Tarazi was known and I think at one of his longest appointments at St. Vladimir's Seminary in New York for being an Old Testament scholar. But his scholarship has gone much beyond the, the Old Testament, entered the New Testament as, as well, and, and the general kind of worldviews around both of those places. And in addition to that, way before he did any of those things, he finished his MD. So he he actually had this this medicine training. So that's that's cool that you had so many layers of of interest there. Actually, I have an Ethiopian friend who went to Holy Cross first for undergraduate and then completed his master's at at St. Vlad's, where he was uh, Father Paul's last in-person student, one-on-one -on -one for Hebrew. Is uh, that right? <laughs> I can't imagine what that would have been like. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I had a little taste of that a number of years ago, took a class with him in a, in a small group setting, and boy, that was 
So that tell, was, tell uh, us about it. What, what, um, it, it was, it was your undergraduate degree. I imagine, is it mostly an undergraduate degree there at Holy Cross or what was it? Oh no, Holy Cross is so on the campus, there's Hellenic college, which is their undergrad program. And then mm -hmm. Holy Cross is their school of theology, which is graduate level. Okay. So, okay. You know, primarily it's a seminary for, for training of clergy. And so there are graduate level uh, tracks, so to speak. So you can do the masters. I don't know what the work, the names are these days, but mm -hmm. masters in theology versus, you know, and then the seminary track, which I was of course, obviously not on that. Um, and then there are a few other uh, avenues, so to speak, that you could, you could go to there for degrees and for master's degrees. So. Yeah. So that's interesting that you said that it was kind of a formative moment for you in the Bible, but mm -hmm. for you to get to that formative moment, you must have had some sort of passion for Orthodox Christianity already to, to get you there. What Was it not any sort of biblical motivation that, that originally got you into Holy Cross or what was that big motivation? Cause I didn't, I didn't realize it was graduate level work that you were, you were doing there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, let's see. How did I get there? I'm g going back in my mind. Well, I had finished college I, in 93 and I, I was working on campus and I, you know, just living my life as a new graduate. And well, you know, my, did I, I don't know if you know that my, my father is a Greek Orthodox priest. No, I didn't know that. I did not know that. So, you know, I, I, um, my father's Greek or been an Orthodox priest for many years. And so I grew up, you know, obviously in that context, but I think in a way um, I'm grateful for My mother is not Greek uh, by mm -hmm. the by. And so she, uh, she became Orthodox later, but I bring them up because they're a little bit unusual. I didn't grow up. My, my dad was a sort of like father Mark Bulos. He was a, a lay priest, you know, had a, had another profession and then, you know, served the church as needed. And so I, I feel like I, I had a more normal upbringing, meaning I, I wasn't in this, this hyper fishbowl of, of parish life um, from young. So, that makes sense. so yeah, so my dad, you know, really smart man, um, you know, voracious reader in all sorts of subjects, um, you know, always had, had friends in that were from other cultures. So mm -hmm. anyway, that is to say my, my parents were kind of cool people. And, um, and so uh, I was interested in the church and things of the church, just from exposure to, you know, my dad and his work and what he was interested in in church. And so I did a lot of my own study. And especially when I finished college, I, you know, and I've always been a reader. So I did a lot of my own study. And honestly, I didn't have any grand plans. I, I actually, didn't care so much about the degree, yeah. but when I heard about the school, I, I forget how, and I thought, wow, there are only like a hundred people there, you know, it was really <laughs> small. And then I thought, oh, cool. And there, and it's like about church and church things and orthodoxy. I thought, how fun. It seemed like camp to me. Yeah. So I thought I really, honestly, I thought it'd be fun. And I thought, well, if I don't do it now, you know, you live, you work, you buy things and then you get stuck. So I just said, let's go. So I, I moved. I uh, actually with a couple of friends who were also going, we drove, we did like a cross country trek. It was really fun. And um, moved to Boston in 95 just to go to the school for fun. So that's so awesome. And so mm -hmm. from Father Paul, you learned what New Testament, Old Testament, or were any particular or languages or language study or what was it? Right. Uh, so it was Old Testament. Uh, my, you know, my Old Testament intro course, he, Father Paul was teaching at the school, I think, you know, uh, once a week, he would come from New York. Um, and so it was Old Testament. And then it wasn't long before I realized um, that, that that really was worth studying to me. I mean, mm -hmm. that was, so I, of course, I was enrolled in the program. So I had other yeah. courses, patristics and you know, church history, et cetera. Um, but as I said, when I, when I started to, when I was introduced to Father Paul's teaching about scripture, which I had completely novel to me, I'd never heard it before. Um, there was just something in me that said that this is where I belong, that that in terms of what to give my attention to. 
And so I continued really, um, I finished, you know, like a year of the program, so to speak. And then I just decided I was only going to take things in scripture. So whenever Father Paul had a class, I was auditing it or finding a way to finding a way to be there. So I did a bunch of new te Old Testament courses. And um, yeah, and then it was later, much later that I took a Hebrew class with him and other study, but but that was in a, in a different context. See, I, I absolutely love the sort of ad hoc nature to it because so many people go into their studies and mm -hmm. all they have as their telos, as their end goal is, mm -hmm. I want this degree so that I can get this profession. And mm. it sort of skips the kind of in between the journey, which I think any good story or narrative, which is a big part of, of course, the teaching of Father Paul is focusing on narrative and story, um, mm. focuses on the kind of journey itself. And it sounded like you were pursuing the education, the learning for the sake of the learning itself, not not with some sort of other, you know, end goal or agenda in mind, right? When people bring agendas to scripture, that's when they're often there to twist it. But you just mm -hmm. seemed like you were trying to immerse yourself in, in the project. And, you know, however much, you know, I am a teacher and I'll be called a teacher. And that for me, I have that mentality of forever being kind of a student. I, I remember, uh, and I want to hear from you more about it later, but you sent us a very exciting email and I say exciting in the sense of it was exciting for me because I mm -hmm. saw how much excitement you had and <laughs> that excitement was itself contagious in <laughs> terms of a new manuscript that you, you came across. C could you tell us like how you came across this manuscript and for, for those who maybe on a, on a more basic level who don't quite know what that is, could, could you just talk to us about what manuscript study is, is about and what is it for? Sure. Oh gosh. Um, Yes. So uh, let's see how, where to start. So that to your question, the email that I sent. So, you know, the project that you and I are involved in, which is a six part series of Bible study, basically um, on the study of Galatians, the book of Galatians. So um, I, whenever I'm tasked with teaching something, something from Bible, I, I often will go back to the original manuscripts. Um, if, if for no other reason than for inspiration. So mm -hmm. when I mean manuscripts, I mean, so there's a website and thank God for the internet now because so many of these Amen. things are digitized. So we get to see them from our living room, it's totally amazing. So um, the earliest um, biblical manuscripts that we have that exist, that we know about are really the old, I think the oldest one's been dated, I think to the fourth century so far that's mm -hmm. been known. And then there are others. There's a there are others that are seventh century, and then into the Middle Ages. Um, so they're referred to as the Codex. If you hear the Codex, um, Sinaiticus is one. Um, there are a number of them. And so there's a website called the Center for um, I, I don't actually know the title. The Center for New Testament Manuscript Study. Um, they have taken it on to digitize these manuscripts, and so. Um, they are, um, many of them are in fragments. And yeah. so some of them are in very, very small pieces and they're made from the oldest ones are made from a combination of animal skins and plant fibers. And so it's very interesting, just my little independent study on what were they made of? And, and so, um, you know, that's, that's the fourth century. And so the, what, let me think, um, I believe that the oldest, the fourth century manuscripts, we have fragments of Old Testament and New Testament, and they're all written in Greek. So the oldest that I'm aware of, the Old Testament manuscripts that exist that we know of are in Greek are the Septuagint translation mm -hmm. of the Hebrew, and then of course the New Testament in Greek. Yeah, and the so Masoretic text not coming around till the 800s or 1000. Yeah. Yes. And then we just don't have any copies of the original Hebrew from which the Septuagint was translated. Yes, I'm not aware of any. Um, so, so I got excited because when I was preparing my study for Galatians, I looked up what might you know what might be out there in the way of um, did the manuscript exist? You know, which one do we have for Galatians? So I was looking around the website and I found 
called um, Papyrus 46, I believe, which contains um, portions of the book of Galatians, pretty much the complete chapter six and then other fragments. But um, so I got excited because we found, I found a full chapter of Galatians in among the, the manuscript on the Papyrus 46. So it's really neat on the website because you can, you can, um, you can zoom in and, and, you know, like with an, with a magnifying glass and look, and look all over the manuscript. Unfortunately, it won't let you really save it. So you can't, uh, I, tried, I tried a zillion times to try to save it. You screenshot um, it. <laughs> I guess so. But, uh, but so it's, it's really neat. I just, I'm fascinated by that. And I, I think one of the reasons I find it so interesting is because as moderns, we don't think about how this was really originally written. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have a book and now we have things like Kindle, yeah. we have audio Bibles. And so we're so far removed from <laughs> what the original form of this writing was. And so I really think that a study of the manuscripts can tell you a lot about the intention of the I author. agree. One you of know, the simple how, things that people forget are the chapters and verses, right? Like yes. when you're looking at the manuscript, I assume there are no chapters and verses in these old manuscripts you're looking at. Not only are there no chapters and verses, there's no punctuation. There's no, there's no punctuation and more. There are, there is no spacing between the words. And so you just get this real appreciation that these materials were very expensive, very precious as was the ink. And so there's no spacing um, there, uh, no punctuation, no spacing. And so you can imagine, what does that say? <laughs> what, what does it say? It says a lot of, it says that these things were officially produced. You know, this was mm -hmm. not a cheap endeavor and that what was written was um, carefully thought out, carefully, you know, words carefully chosen and um and so you know all kinds of other things um, i i also took a study I'm, I'm working on it on the scrolls on you know not just the manuscript sleeves and pieces but what does a scroll look like and how was it how did it function and so that's another aspect of um the study of kind of the original works that Oh, I, I love it. I love it. Scroll is probably one of my favorite words in the English language. I know, right? <laughs> the yeah. yeah. You know, the fact that if you can almost imagine it being ceremonially used, you know, liturgically, that's the other yep. lesson is that these things were liturgically used, meaning that there was a special class of people who read these aloud to the congregation. Not everybody read and very few probably wrote at the time. And so just this, this idea of um, that as, as the reader would unroll it, you can't read ahead. No, you're right? bound. You're bound. And so I, I, I just, when I really thought about that and watched a couple of videos about you know the scroll and how it works, I thought, oh my gosh, this is completely relevant to our study because it reminds you that you don't have control over the text. It's being read to you. And so, which means you can't pick and choose. You can't skip ahead. You don't know the end of the story. You have to listen to it as it's told to you. So, um, but today, you That's know, we, right. we wouldn't understand that because we have books and we read ahead and, you know, we fast forward when we're bored and, you know, it's <laughs> to the end. So, yeah, that's kind of my... Pause it to go eat. Yeah, exactly. So that's my interest with the, with the manuscripts. I just think it's so telling. Very important. It's, it's so beautiful. And we glossed over a couple of points. So I want to make sure that everyone understands this at home, that mm -hmm. in order for Andrew to be able to get into these manuscripts, that means that she studied a little bit of her Kone or her old Greek. <laughs> yes, a little bit. Um, I, you know, I'm by no means, you know, an expert in language for sure. But um, What's nice is that there are so many, gosh, I mean, the numbers of websites out there available for free. To teach. To teach. Every translation of the Bible digitized, you can, that's searchable, and that'll have the English with, you know, the Greek translation. And so I sort of combined uh, resources in order to make sense of the manuscripts because it's not easy to follow the script. 
Mm -hmm. um, if you have another, you know, online or on a book, the Greek Old Testament, the Greek rather New Testament open, you can you can follow along. That's um, right. So yeah, so it's it's a fascinating study. But you do you do have to have a little bit of um, patience. You know, it's it's a little bit tedious to try to make sense of it. And um, and so I'm a real real newbie at, at um, the languages. Yeah, I I still cannot read Greek proper. There are some letters that they've just shown up with so much frequency that I know what they are, you know, because they've been a part of like fraternities and sororities and I've seen them elsewhere or, mm -hmm. or things like that. Right. Or you see them in science, right. These certain Greek letters that mm -hmm. I know. Um, so often when I'm looking at the new Testament to give people an example of someone who doesn't know the Greek script, mm -hmm. I will use what's called the Mount Mount's interlinear new Testament, mm -hmm. which again is another free resource where you mm -hmm. can see the, the Greek transliterated into the Latin script, what we use for English, and then mm -hmm. I'll use Greek dictionaries to find out mm -hmm. what those words are. And, and sometimes even if I see like the Greek itself, because sometimes they'll have the transliteration next to the Greek, I can copy and paste that. And again, there's so many resources on the internet that you've mentioned that have done that. I just, this uh, quarantine, finally taught myself how to read the Hebrew. And again, mm -hmm. the, the understanding and comprehension is not there. You know, I have a few words mostly that I've, I've picked up from Father Paul, Father Mark, and Dr. Richard, and, and a few that I've picked up elsewhere. But now I'm able to, if the, you know, for the most part, follow along in the English, like you said, as best as I can. And mm -hmm. if there's anything puzzling, if I think, oh, I'm not getting the whole picture here, or if I think there's anything suspicious, or even sometimes when I don't think that, just to check myself anyway, I will then very slowly and tediously read that passage in, mm -hmm. in the Hebrew now. And mm -hmm. then again, because of my comprehension is not there, if I see something that looks off or is a pattern, I'll look it up in a lexicon or in a dictionary, which mm -hmm. again are available for free. There's so many resources, so many things that are in the public domain that a lot of us don't have excuses. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to to get to talk to you because I think the more examples, right, the more mashal uh, people have of real human beings who are delving into this work, I think the, the more in, encouraged that they're going to be. So a few months ago, um, you helped as editor, and I, and I know you've been working on it since earlier. So I was looking through my email the other day. I, I got emails from 2018 from when you were like uh, working on this, but it's the fetch, a fetch rift in honor of Father Paul Terazi. Now, fetch rift is a very funny German word, which I'm probably butchering the pronunciation. And I actually have the Old Testament fetch rift from, um, from this from OCABs, I, ha I, am, I have looked and seen the New Testament and the intertestamental one. I'm mm -hmm. not sure the, the one that you worked on. Could you tell us mm -hmm. what, what was there a general theme, you know, besides scripture or what was um, kind of the, the guiding thought behind that and, and how you got into that work? Yeah, um, so that came about because, as you say, there was a fest shrift that was produced a number of years ago for Father Paul at the occasion, I believe, if I, my memory serves, of his retirement from mm -hmm. teaching. And then um, that was a, that was a little bit on a bigger scale. There were many contributors and um, that was produced by, I'm not even sure who the publisher was there, but I wasn't involved in that production. And then um, in 20, a couple of years ago, 2017, 2018, um, we all gathered, it was a, another, we did our annual kind of OCABS gathering celebration. And it was um, the celebration of 50 years, Father Paul having taught for 50 years, but also on the occasion, it was, it was very close to his birthday, it happened to be. And so um, the decision was taken to do another compilation, another fest trift um, of student contributions. So basically what it is, it's, the work of the students of a teacher, they, their productions are published in a compendium and it is a, um, in honor, in honor of their teacher, basically. So, um, it was, it was very interesting. I, um, I contributed a paper that year, uh, to the OCAB session, which was actually my first, the first time I presented anything. I had been attending sessions since the beginning, since the uh -huh. 
99 we started, but this was the first year, it was about two years ago that I presented, so I was very nervous. It was my first work of my own. And um, so I'm a slow learner. It's taken me 20 years to understand. Better late than never. And the, the wage is the same no matter the hour, right? Yes, that's right. So I was just asked uh, by some of the folks involved in the planning of it if I would be willing to help out with the book and the editing. And so, you know, it was a big honor to be asked. So that's how I came to be involved. I was just asked to help out. And, um, and so here we are. So I, I worked with a few other folks, vocabs folks on it. And we have about... How many do we have? We have 12, 12 or so, 12 or 16 um, contributions, different student papers in a fairly small paperback. And From uh, various talk. clergy and, and laity as well. Yes, that's right. So clergy, we have um, a couple of lay folks, including myself. And um, yeah, so it was a really interesting project. I learned a lot reading all the papers. And uh, I certainly, I learned a lot about editing too. Um, <laughs> Done that before, so, yeah. and, and was it more grammatical or also content based? Because those are two different kind of editing styles. Yes, uh, it was a bit of both. Um, so, and it's interesting in biblical studies because you have the aspect of the other languages. So, mm -hmm. you know, people writing in English, yes, but referencing the text. So, you have to deal with Hebrew characters and Greek characters, and that can cause um, some headaches trying to, you know, standardize everything. Um, what else about that? Uh, it was both. I mean, they had to edit for content as well in as much as, as the editor, it's a little bit of a fine line because you don't want to, I realized I, I actually goofed in the beginning of the project because I realized that you have to let people have their voice, mm -hmm. right? So even if, even if to my mind, the writing could be better or more mm -hmm. clear, you can't, you can't take somebody's voice away. Do you know? Oh, hundred percent. So, um, so I had to make those judgments. You know, well, how how can I kind of make this a little bit more clear or sound a little, you know, when awkward phrasing or whatever, and not rob them of their voice. So yeah, so I learned to try to balance that. So it's it's a little bit of everything. My my bias is simplicity. You know, I I kind of I was raised on them. Um, Strunk and White's Elements of Style book. Yes. And so, uh, you know, that's my favorite. I love that little book for so many reasons. And in fact, E.B. White's probably one of my favorite authors ever. Oh, yeah. But, um, so I was raised on, you know, raised myself on principles of simplicity and clarity in writing always. And so you know, I find academic writing to not be that. And so <laughs> it's a challenge for me to say, you know, these folks express themselves this way and you know, I just personally I, I I struggle with writing that is not simple and clear. So I I own a copy of Strunk and White. I don't know where I misplaced it. I need to get to it. I read William Zinser's on writing and oh, he basically yeah, yeah, he he was highly, highly I mean to the point he was influenced to the point where I would say he's a disciple of, of mm -hmm. E.B. White. And um, obviously, you know, I grew up on Charlotte's web and Stuart, um, Stuart little to this day, my phone greeting gets everybody to chuckle and laugh, you know, and even, you know, I'm overly, I have this ability to be overly formal, but then also super informal. You know, I think that it's in Psalm two, it says that the, he who is enthroned in the heavens laughs. And I always try to reflect a little bit of the humor that I believe God has, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's an essential part of, uh, life, not to be too platonic. Um, but I think, uh, laughing is functional. Let me say is uh, yeah. a better way of saying that. <laughs> and, um, so, so, you know, to this day, I say greetings and salutations, you know, and that's like one of those things that I picked I up from it. the spider and Charlotte's web yes. from, from yes. E.B. White. So mm -hmm. I'm so glad that that you referenced that. And that that redundancy is a, is a point that I think um, I agree with. At the same time, you know, you you know when to kind of let let go of it. Father Dustin Lyon and I had a discussion recently about two translations, one of the Older Testament, one of the newer, um, the newer one by David Bentley Hart, the older one by Robert Alter. And the interesting thing about those translations, I'll throw a third one in there, the, the Kingdom New Testament that I have by N.T. Wright. 
is that mm -hmm. all of these translations were done by individuals as opposed to committees. I, I used to work as an organizational ombudsman, which is kind of this band-aid conflict manager that uh, healthcare facilities as well as universities hire. And mm -hmm. the issue is always about scale. At a small scale level, no healthcare facility or university would ever need an organizational ombudsman. But as they expand to the thousands and thousands of employees, mm -hmm. through the standardization process, th there's a human element that's lost. So when you talk about 12 people, it's different than one person. And, you know, and the more numbers you increase, the more of that happens. So that voice that you're talking about is, I think, that, that human element that we see also as institutions, and it's an inherent part, in my opinion, of standardization, and it's something that folks just have to kind of critically think about and, and weigh the options. I remember one of my favorite writers, H.L. Mencken, is an early 20th century journalist, and mm -hmm. he was known for strong arming the, the people that he was editor over to the point where people, again, just felt like everyone there was parroting his voice because of the way he would just, you know, change mm -hmm. their words. So I, I like that you, you reflected the kind of autonomy or the the voice of each person because i think you know there's not just one way to to preach god's word uh, for sure the the teaching is the same but different people respond to to i think different levels now now you were inspired by someone like father paul right who i i think is a, a kind of uh you know, I can say this and, and, and still it be polite, like a harsh teacher in terms of there's there's no holding back the power of the of the evangelion of the gospel. Like you you get the the full force of it. Whereas I think maybe other people may try to soften the blow <laughs> of, of scripture, and we could talk about you know what that means. Um, other other people in your life are there others in your life who have influenced you? And and I wonder if we were if you were using this this kind of measuring stick of saying how harshly or how softly they presented the gospel. Do you, do you think they were more soft in it or, or more harsh? Uh, sorry, who do you mean? Uh, anyway, in terms of, in terms of anybody that, that you've encountered in terms of, you said it was your first time presenting, right? And now we've seen in, for example, in this Galatian study, which is against racism, right? Attacking the idea of identity, not only of the oppressor, but also of the, oppressy uh, the, the oppressed and the oppressor kind of questioning the identity of both of them because both of their identities are are rooted in in earthly identities that yeah. that is kind of a harsh teaching to yeah. to tell people whereas i think oftentimes um the 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 social justice within the gospel may be simplified in in the discussions i see to a simple oppressor versus oppressee where mm. you know you it, it it becomes one sided and there's mm. almost a self aggrandizement that that is entertained there. So I don't know if you had seen I don't I don't want to force that that view no, of I, of others on you, but if you had seen something like that, I would I would love to hear about that too. Uh, let's see. I so for me to your to your sort of the question you started with, you know, um, I. How shall I say it? I th hmm. Part of, I think, the necessary harshness, um, and I'm trying to think of how to say this in a pithy way. <laughs> so I think that I, I think that, okay, good Orthodox, you know, folks, I, I grew up, uh, you know, baptized Orthodox, always in Orthodox church. I never uh, church shopped or anything like that. <laughs> So what I, I guess what I mean is that whatever discussion about Bible that occurred, and I, and I really don't remember much, you know, perhaps Sunday school, um, you know, sermons on Sundays, I didn't have a lot of exposure to scripture. Um, and that, that that I did was essentially a, a theologically framed philosophical explanation of Bible, which at the time I didn't know any different. I didn't know that there might be another perspective or that, um, that that was in any way an error. 
And so um, knowing nothing of that. And so, you know, kids are kids. You ask questions, mom and dad, you know, why is it this way? You know, <laughs> why? Uh, I don't know. Um, things that children ask, you know, why was it Adam and Eve? You know, why did it have, why was it a snake? Why, you know, children ask silly things. And, you know, parents say what they say just to, uh, frankly, just to get kids to move on to some other subject because it's awkward and they really don't know what to say. But um, in any case, I think so. That said, what I mean to say is that I think my upbringing to scripture was very simplistic and, and really not, um, it wasn't delivered to me in a way that I heard when I went to Holy Cross. And so once I heard that other perspective, and, you know, from Father Paul, honestly, I, I'm not, I wasn't, whatever manner in which it was delivered, it didn't matter to me. It wasn't, it didn't affect me. I was listening to the content. And so, yes, mm -hmm. this, you know, Father Paul's a very emphatic about things. Um, but, but I heard it and I heard it really for, and, and it was that clang of truth. If you've ever in other contexts, you know, that clang of truth. When you just hear something that you know somebody's not BSing you in that moment, you know, and um, and so that's kind of how it happened for me. And then, of course, my study from then on was kind of re I was reformatted with an understanding that was that was you know quite different and in in a way quite challenging to the religious structures and organization, which is you know the Bible as literature and what does that mean. And that this is a text that is to be understood as any other text. And just because it's the Bible, we don't put our brain on the shelf and then, you know, pray over it as though through osmosis, we're going to understand. It's <laughs> I really disagree with that um, namby pamby way of dealing with, with the Bible. And I do think I, I, I see I'm Orthodox, so I can say this, I guess. I, I think it's a real um it's missing, you know, we don't, we don't really, um, scripture doesn't have a place of interest and study that I, that I would hope it would. And I think we're working on that. You know, that's why we're out there. Many of us trying to encourage it because it's super important. I mean, I could talk all day about that um, why those reasons are, but I don't know if that, if that kind of, it does. It does. And I, I thank you. That's exactly my mind frame. It's why I wanted to have you on again. I think conversations like these are going to, as I mentioned earlier, infect and contain like it, it, it's a contagion. It's an infection. P mm -hmm. They're going to see the, the passion and excitement with which you approach the scriptural text. And that mm -hmm. is shared by me, which is why we're able to have a conversation on this higher level. And sometimes, as I said, different teaching styles help different folks. The high level, I think, is is great to to stimulate the intellectual person. One of the people I always think about is um, Presbytera Eugenia Constantino was a, a great part of my early biblical formation. And, mm -hmm. you know, she was one of the first kind of orthodox people with a podcast that I, I just consumed, you know, every episode. And she... Uh, told us, you know, her listeners through the podcast that this story of how St. Augustine came mm. to be a Christian, right? He was very antithetical. He had various ideologies that were popular, Manichaeism and things like that at the time, but he happened to be in Milan and St. Ambrose was preaching publicly on the Hebrew Bible, on the Older Testament. And he walked by and for the first time in his life, he heard, um, I don't want to use the kind of terms people typically use, so again, I'll stick to functional and say a functional teaching of the Old Testament, a functional teaching of the creation story. Mm -hmm. And he'd never heard it intellectualized in that matter. And that drew him in a way that I think other people um, would not have been drawn. I, I remember back in 2012 is when I began teaching in Sunday school. You mentioned Sunday school earlier. Mm -hmm. And one of the moments that I really got up the courage to do that because I'm a cradle Orthodox like you too, but I pretty much stopped going to church for about a decade. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back, you know, it was after having graduated college and kind of coming into myself and it was more just as a student, but I was getting encouraged to teach. And I was like, well, I, I don't know exactly what everybody believes. 
And mm -hmm. the I, I really thank God for the, the bishop we have now, who was just a monk at the time, and the, the priest and even Sunday school teachers that we had at my parish, because my parish, I will say, is the most Bible-minded parish in the the EOTC in, in North America, and I'll say that unapologetically. I won't say that about Ethiopia itself, because in Ethiopia, we have this this kind of, uh, as there's a school of Antioch, there's a school of Aksum. And they have people who literally read the Bible out loud and interpret it every single day. So we can't compete with them. You know, ours is a part-time project, but at least of the part-time folks, um, my parish Virgin Mary's in Los Angeles does, does very well. And um, one of the things that really encouraged me was the same thing, which is why I, I felt akin to St. Ambrose and St. Augustine is because the priest at my parish taught a functional teaching of the mm -hmm. creation story talking about day one, two, three, four, five, and six, and how they come to a close, and how on the seventh day, it doesn't mention the closing. And people mm -hmm. could go fact check me by going and reading Barashit or Genesis. But mm -hmm. he proposed the question. He didn't even make the statement, but he pro proposed this subjunctive question. What if we were still on the seventh day of rest right now as mm -hmm. we are approaching um, scripture all the time? And, and, and anyway, that, that's kind of the high level. For, for those who maybe are just beginning, do you have, we've had such a, a lovely time today, do you have any sort of advice for someone on how they can start? Now, obviously you started in a kind of higher theological setting, but I don't know if you've encountered or if people have asked you for your advice because they, they've seen the kind of work that you've been doing for, for 20 years now, but what, what sort of, advice would you give to someone who's just beginning to get into scripture? Well, I would say, you know, um, I would say one, you know, first I'd say calm down because I think, <laughs> I think people, I mean, I, I myself included, people are, you know, incredibly intimidated by this text. Um, and so, you know, it's massive, right? It's, I think it's, I can't remember the numbers, but I, I mean, the Iliad and the Odyssey combined are far, have far fewer words than the, the body of the Bible, the cor whole corpus, both Testaments. So that said, I would say, honestly, you know, um, and this is in keeping with our friend, Bethany Saros, who just recently you had, did a lovely interview with her on your show about her book, which- The Light in the Dark. Yes, it's so it's she's put out a resource for parents and children and it's really just just read it just follow the story. So if you're just starting and you don't know the ancient languages and you know how many of us really do and have a, a real facility with it simply read it and I would say that I would start from the beginning and treat it like a story. So right so you wouldn't go to a movie and start in the middle. Mm -hmm. You know wouldn't, you don't read a book like that. You don't open up, you don't, somebody hands you a novel on a summer vacation. You don't start on page 25, right? You start at the beginning. So those kinds of things help me to, to know how to proceed in sort of a rational, reasonable way. And so because the story is a unit and has a beginning and an end that are intentional, I recommend start from the beginning, just read it, read it in English or whatever language you know, is yours and better yet have it read to you. So there's a, I, I have an app on my phone, which is an audio Bible. And so not all the time, because sometimes I'm in the mood for other books or music or whatever, but I play it in the car. So you can just that you just press, you know, Genesis one and it, and it re it's read to me in English and they have, they have ones that are dramatized and dramatized. I don't yeah. remember. I don't recommend dramatization. I don't. I don't but either. I, I've listened to those at some times, but uh, it's painful because uh, it's interpretation. I don't want. I don't want that. I, I want to hear the story as plainly as I can hear it. So I would say start at the beginning and just read it, and better yet, have it read to you, whether it's an app or a friend, or you know, maybe make a, a routine with your family that you read a chapter a night and someone in your family reads it to the rest of the family. And in fact, Bethany and I just had a conversation the other day. It was very interesting. And we were talking about how in, in prior generations, 
um, you know, the Bible, the family Bible, you know, this was a thing, you know, this was a big, pre a, a big kind of um, institution in family life, you know, on the prairie, you know, I, I think of things like Little House on the Prairie and, and you know, the mythology around Abe Lincoln. Oh, yeah. And it's it's been said that he learned to read and write from the Bible, the family Bible, wasn't formally educated. So That's we were talking. Parents learned. Yes, we were we were just we had the most interesting conversation about how that that's kind of a theme that that the Bible has served as a catechism for just learning, reading and writing. And mm -hmm. so I would say that would be my advice. I would start at the beginning and, um, you know, don't lose don't lose heart. It's a long story <laughs> and oftentimes a boring story. Um, but I like to use Father Tarazi's interpretation of boring which is to drill yeah right? it bores into you <laughs> that's exactly the purpose of the text it's yeah. instructive so um so if you can have you know patience through it that that's what i would do that's what i do i listen i have it read to me um and then if you if you get interested in something specific or curious or you're not sure if you're understanding something correctly there's a zillion i mean there are so many there are websites I use all the time that are free that can show me the text in the original language with the English. And not only that, but you can be connected to the concordance on that word. So if you have a question about what that word means, you're it's all there. And uh, and so if if you are more curious, there is a lot of resources. So I would say you know just pacing and not getting overwhelmed by the length of the text. And by the fact that it just seems like it's this mysterious book somehow, um, it, it needn't be so. And 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 it's important because it's 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 instruction. It's the word of God, right? So um, this is not um, at the same time that I say it's a text. Use your brain. Just read it. Um, it's an important one, right? It's a constitutional text. It's it's not um, just another book that you dust off. That you don't read in your household so that's what i that's my advice i think <laughs> thank you so thank you so much that's that's sage advice for people to start to be incremental and mm -hmm. and gradual you know if you see for example a giant pizza you don't stuff it all in your face at once you, you know you grab a slice and some people even like to cut that slice in two to to make it more digestible so i think mm -hmm. you've uh, you've really presented a way in which people can do it and let people have it bore into them. For those of our listeners and our audience who are in Los Angeles like us, they could swing by Hawthorne to see SpaceX with Elon Musk's boring company as he bores holes beneath Los Angeles. And then when you see that, I hope you remember Andrea's example so that you can get that uh, with scripture boring inside of you. Thank you so much for coming onto the program today. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.